Good morning. Welcome to the gathering of people we call Pase Panjang Christ Church. This morning we have Peace Care Group with us. Earlier this week, I asked the deacon in charge of Peace Care Group, can you please nominate any strong men who are coming? I need people to volunteer for my opening illustration. He gave me three names. And so, two of you, I've invited to come up your care group, Deacon in Charge, thinks you are strong. So we'll ask Brother Ban Heng and Brother Joseph, would you come up to help me with the illustration this morning? As a matter of precaution, I will put on my mask. Thank you, Brother Joseph. Thank you, Brother Ban Heng. On my right is Brother Joseph, strong man, obviously, who's going to be married next year. Lord willing, amen. Okay. On my left, we have Brother Ban Heng, math professor, okay, very strong as well, because he's going to calculate how to break chopsticks. Now, both of you take out from your packets a single chopstick. There's a single chopstick. Now, single chopsticks being alone, I think are easier to break. Okay, let's have Brother Joseph try that first. Wow, strong man. I mean, come on, those of you here, encourage your brother here, strong man. Okay, now he's going to calculate the, 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 the angle to break this. All right, strong man, strong man. Now, they're going to take out some more, and then they're going to try to break that little package. I've combined about six pairs of chopsticks. Okay, so six pairs of chopsticks. Let's see whether they can break this. Okay. Wow, they're exerting a lot of energy. Whoa, almost there. Okay, brother, running the Well done. Thank you very much, brothers, and to thank you. One brand's essence for you, and one brand's essence for you. Thank you very much, brothers. Thank you. Appreciate your help this morning. This is Peace Care Group, strong men. Okay. Obviously, a single chopstick is easier to break than many put together. The Bible says two are better than one, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. Today's passage contains many, many names. Some people gloss over this passage. They don't want to read it. They say, Christianity is about theology. Romans is about theology. Therefore, this passage is not about theology. I can skip it. But Christianity isn't just about theology. Romans isn't just about theology. Gospel transformation requires relationship. Paul tells the people at Rome, let's be together for the gospel. Let's join together for the gospel. He uses an entire chapter in Romans to press home this point. There's a single word that's repeated over and over and over in the passage we read. Now, Peace Care Group is here, and I'm sure they're very attentive. What is the word repeated 20 times in this passage? Greet! Very good! I'm sure you got it at home as well. Greet. What does that mean? In fact, Paul says, greet, 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 and then he ends up with this. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. You say, Pastor, holy kiss there. Paul is asking me to kiss people there. All right. Listen here. The Italian Roman kiss is not mouth to mouth, lah. Okay, it is cheek to cheek, lah, by the side one. Plus, we are not Italians, right? We are not in Rome. This is not common for us. And so we have to apply the Bible timeline too, right? And say, how do we apply this to our context today? And that term, greet is loaded 
with a sense and principle of affection. When I go home, I miss my family every week, I can't live stream with them. When I go home and I enter the house, I don't walk past my family members, I don't walk past my wife and my two sons as if I don't know who they are, you know, as if they're strangers to me. There's an affection that we have. My wife, whenever I leave the house, she always comes to the door. She tells me, just in case, just in case I don't see you again. There's affection. There's deep affection. There's relationship. Greeting one another with a holy kiss is not simply just the platonic kind of, hello, how are you? That's important. But it descends beyond just the surface to relationships that we build for the gospel. Here's the point, brothers and sisters. Christianity is not practiced as a solo sport. We join together with family affection. I'll repeat that. Christianity is not practiced as a solo sport. We are to join together with family affection. The gospel is lived and shared as a team. One chopstick is easily broken. But many chopsticks together is not easily broken. Family gets involved together in the lives of others. I know my sons. I know their schedules. I know their likes and dislikes. Because there's relationship. Gospel living is that we get involved in the lives of each other. This is not easy. It's not easy because in Singapore we're busy, but it's not easy because in Singapore we're guarded. We could take a poll today of Singaporeans. If Trace Together app is not made compulsory, how many will download the Trace Together app? How many of you scared? Hey, you track my movements. Ah. Singaporeans, by and large, are guarded and value privacy. That's not a bad thing. It's just that. When we come into the family of God where we are all children of our Heavenly Father, when we come into a local church, Paul gives a resounding cry. He says, join together for the gospel. Now, I want to share with you some details about the names that he gives in Romans 16. He gives over 30 names. Some of you may not have picked this up, but there's a huge variety in the names that he greets. Number one, some of these names, a majority of them, are Gentile names. But clearly, there are some Jewish names. Mary is Jewish, I and mean, that was the name of Jesus' mother. But her niece is quite clearly Gentile, Greek. Both Jews and Gentiles were in the Roman church. Not only that, number two, there were names of people clearly in high authority. He says, the treasurer of the city greets you. Hey, the treasurer is someone big, like, huh? But, at the same time, there are names clearly of those who are slaves or were freed from slavery who came to believe in Jesus Christ. This variety in the church at Rome, this variety in the names which he greets, this variety in his call to join together for the gospel shows us that whatever our differences are, whether culturally or socioeconomically, we are to join together for the gospel. Yesterday, about 40 of us joined together to study how to get it right. We studied Bible tools, and yesterday's tool was the context tool. And we learned that we don't just read the verse or the paragraph. We have to broaden out our reading 
to the section. And we apply that to Romans 16, and we go slightly just before in Romans chapter 15. What do we see? We see in Romans chapter 15, verse 30, an appeal by Paul. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive, to join the struggle together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Be involved. Get together. Join the struggle with me for the gospel. Please, I appeal to you, Roman church, I've never seen you before, but join together with me for the gospel. And then he goes and cites 30 names whom he knows in the church at Rome. Join in the struggle together for the gospel because living and sharing the gospel is a team effort regardless of how different we are. We can commit to live and share the gospel as a team. COVID-19 teaches us many lessons. One lesson that COVID-19 teaches us is that we are not meant to be alone. During the pandemic, there's an increased emphasis, finally, on mental wellness. Because many people who live alone or struggle being lonely suffer from the pressure of mental health issues. We are created relational beings. That's why when the lockdown happens or when the circuit breaker happens, we all frown. We all have a heavy feeling. Mankind isn't meant to live alone. A relational God made us relational beings. It isn't that you have to be Mr. Popular. Don't get me wrong. This passage is not about being popular. This passage is about building meaningful relationships. Think about this. Paul has never visited the church at Rome. And yet he already knows so many people who are there because he has interacted with them as partners together for the gospel. Rome was the center of the world at this time. All roads lead to Rome. It is natural that many people would have gone to Rome, whether for economic purposes, jobs, whether for communications purposes. But clearly, he knew people with whom he had come into contact with that were now in the church at Rome. How does he remember so many names? I'm sure Paul visited many places. The book of Acts details his missionary journeys. How does he remember so many names? I think of myself, and I'm not very good for names. In fact, when I was in America, went to a big church, I couldn't remember many names. I became known as Magdalene's husband because my wife knew the names. She had the relationships, especially with the ladies, and they knew her. No one knew me. But let me tell you, let me tell you a fact. I'm quite good at the names of our church family. And the reason I'm good is because I pray for you. I pray for you by name. You mean something to me. There's a relationship. Yes, even more than that church in America whom I didn't know many people. I think that's the difference. I think Paul remembered these names because he had a relationship with them. It isn't just, please come and do work. Just get this done. Okay, spread the five teams, please sort it out. It is building meaningful relationships as we join together for the gospel. Join in the struggle together for the gospel because living and sharing the gospel is a team effort. Build relationships that are personal, warm, inclusive, 
and appreciative. All of these four elements can be seen in the passage. Personal. Paul was personal. The moment church only becomes watching a show, I think there's a problem. Paul named names. He knew these people behind the names. During COVID-19, our small groups have blossomed. There are more people involved in small groups than there ever were before. Why? Because small is beautiful. You know, Singapore is small, and small is beautiful during this time. Our church is not large, and small is beautiful during this time. We have had the opportunity to be personal, to engage in meaningful, personal connections. Committing ourselves to personal relationships becomes one of the challenges in modern Singapore. I've said business is one of them, but also privacy is one of those issues. And very honestly, we struggle, don't we? As a shepherd, I have pushed these two types of accountability for our church. And those that attend new members' class or baptism classes, they know this is compulsory. I've tried to advise everyone who's a member of our church to be accountable at least in two ways. Okay? These are the two ways. Number one, commit to an accountability partner. That's usually your spouse if you're married. Number two, commit to a small group, whether a care group, Active Minds Program, Youth Group, EO2, Golden Blessings, Prayer Group, Ministry Groups, there are many that serve together. I've tried to help us, brothers and sisters, in very busy, very private Singapore to naturally form these personal relationships by pushing us to account to at least one person in your life. If you're married, logically, it should be your spouse. If you're not married, find someone else, just one, whom you can journey together in an intimate way for the gospel. But beyond that, we want to build relationships within the church family, not just to be blessed, but to bless, to be mutually blessing each other. And I think the number one reason why we fear that we don't invest in these small groups for some of us is that we worry we don't have the time or capacity or don't know what to do or worry what happens if people don't like me. I understand, brothers and sisters, there are risks. There are risks. Whenever you step out of your personal, just me, there are risks. Take the risk. Commit to an accountability partner and commit to a small group. There are exceptions. Obviously, we have people suffering from cancer, we have people suffering from very difficult situations. Obviously, in those situations, we care for them. Our small groups go for them to care for them. This is not imposing obligation. This is a joyful experience of joining together for the gospel. Paul is so happy to greet all of his brothers and sisters, all of his partners, by name. He doesn't waste time. You see, people think, this is waste of time, isn't it, Pastor? It's not. Paul uses an entire chapter, and ink and paper surely took effort. I mean, Tertius was the scribe and he was writing, right? <laughs> whatever Paul says, but Tertius has to write whatever Paul says, entire chapter names. How great is that? Authentic relationships around the Word of God and prayer and the application in a genuine way of what we learn from Scripture is going to be really, really helped if we come out of our shell and seek mutual accountability. Students are busy. People who work are busy. Work from home doesn't even help, right? Sometimes you can't even tell when your work hours have stopped 
and I've been helping some people with that. But we want to invest because the Bible says we reap what we sow. Brothers and sisters, this is not an obligation message. This is not you must message. This is look at the blessings message. Look at the gospel blessings. Look at joining together for the gospel and the blessings that it brings. I understand we are busy people in Singapore. And I'm not asking you to invest to be Mr. Popular. I'm asking you to invest in joining together for the gospel. Do it in your own way, but do it in a meaningful way. Find at least an accountability partner and find a small group because small is beautiful. Let's grow to be personal. But besides being personal, there are three other attributes in this passage. Let's grow to be warm and inclusive and appreciative. No, no, not Mr. Popular. We don't have to be Mr. Popular. We grow in transformation to be warm. And I've had a couple of leaders tell me, Master, I didn't grow up like that. Huh? My family very strict one. Huh? You know, this is do this, do this, finish. And their temperament and personality is shaped by that, isn't it? As they grow up, I'm sure our founding prime minister grew up in a very austere environment, and that explains some of his personality and abilities. But we can all grow in the church family to learn to be warm. We can grow beyond the coldness of holding people at arm's length and of imagining that they are glass that we see through when we pass by. I am so glad when our people meet each other outside. I've heard comments during the past few weeks. Hey, I saw this person outside. He said, BPCC. Wow. I said, okay. There's some relationship that's going on where people recognize this and don't pass each other by just like glass. As an acknowledgement. There's an affection. There's a growing warmth. John Sung used to give this example. If you take a piece of charcoal and you put it on its own, very soon this piece of charcoal will fizzle out and there will be no more warmth. But if you take that piece of charcoal, same piece, and you put it together with other hot glowing embers, then it's going to grow brighter and warmer. Warmth begets warmth, brothers and sisters. Our response matters, right? Someone warm to you, be warm back la. You know some people, you try to be warm to them, no response on it. Now I'm not fussing at you, we all grew up differently. But can we not grow in learning to be warm? Now, I didn't say you to be Mr. Popular, remember. But being warm is something that the Apostle Paul clearly illustrates as he remembers each person and the unique features of the partnership together for the gospel. Well, what about being inclusive? You see 30 over names with different backgrounds, right? And here's the thing, right? Paul's never been to that church. And what does he tell them to do? You all greet one another with a holy kiss. <laughs> it's like, I'm here, you're there. You all greet one another. You all receive one another. He's telling the church, please include each other, okay? Please acknowledge each other. All the churches of Christ are going to include you, you There's a genuine inclusive warmth. And then there's a deep personal relationship. Warmth is genuine when really it's reciprocated and built upon. There's nothing like experience, right? 
in relationship, where we journey together to build. Let me show you some of the names that are here. And let's see. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. That's like everyone who's chosen. He just says Rufus is chosen, but we're all chosen. But he's putting Rufus there really for his mother. <laughs> also his mother. Why? Because Rufus' mother was a mother to me as well. I mean, he thinks about Rufus' mother. He thinks about Rufus because there's a mother who loves a son. And that mother also loves me like a son. I mean, Paul has received warmth. And you know it when you receive warmth, don't you? Now, I know it when I receive warmth. As a lady from our church, one of our church members, she calls me periodically before I even call her. She's maybe in her 70s. She says, Pastor, I'm calling you. Huh? How are you? Warmth is felt deep inside. It's this feeling that arises graciously and rightfully when you receive love and kindness and generosity. It can't be put on. It can't be faked. There's a common shared experience that leads to that kind of warmth. A couple of times, I think this past uh, week, I've heard about cycling because we now have a couple of uh, informal groups doing various things, fishing, cycling, badminton, whatever. Praise the Lord. And our people love to connect because in the value of connection, there is the shared experience of war. Now, I hope that when you go cycling or fishing, it's not just about the cycling or fishing. Lah, huh? okay, let's try to build genuinely warm relationships. I tell you, during COVID-19, my family has eaten more chili crab than ever before. Last time, I never eat chili crab. Man. Now, people are sending us chili crab. We are receiving warmth. Now, don't send me chili crab. Right, we have enough. But we are, we are thankful. We are thankful. Because that can't be fake. That, that genuine, warm response to love and kindness and generosity. We do nothing to deserve these kindnesses, but you have been warm, and I thank you for it. Let's grow to be personal and warm, but there's more. Let's grow to be inclusive and appreciative. When I think of being inclusive, I think of the over 30 names that Paul really puts name by name. Some of them, he says, your family, your church, in your house. They met in house churches, yeah? Small is beautiful. They didn't gather in like hundreds. A home could take maybe 70 people if it was very big, okay? And they were very, very different people in very, very different locations. But the unity of the gospel is that we don't forget people who are different. I remember one of our Korean-speaking members. Uh, he's gone to be with his father-in-law in Korea. He's still there. And then he had to have a hernia operation, so he, his flight back was delayed. He'll be, he'll be coming back in December now. Plan to be back in November. But I remember him because before COVID-19, when he was here in church, he would go around greeting everyone. He would go around shaking hands with every single person. Even when he couldn't speak, English so well. There was a genuine desire to be inclusive from a person that we might exclude. That's very instructive, isn't it? Whenever you're feeling low or down, whenever you have this, and sometimes we do, I do too. I really believe this. If you reach out to someone else, whether over the phone, on WhatsApp, in person, if you reach out to someone else and that person is a believer, then the mutual blessings of the gospel will begin to flow as you join together for the gospel. Are you feeling low? Many of us are. During the course of COVID-19, we go through our upheavals in our emotional state. 
Some people can't explain it. It's because of a change in environment. News, maybe. You see news about cases and deaths. Maybe job loss. Maybe someone in your family is affected. Yes, we go through our ups and downs in our emotional life. But when we reach out to someone else, when we reach out to join together for the gospel, it is them that personal, warm, and inclusive blessings will flow. Finally, appreciation. Many people are quick to complain and slow to appreciate. This is human behavior, isn't it? One is, one like that. It's one no good, and one no good. Why you have two people, two people this morning? Why never call me? I'm strong also. How about being appreciative? How about saying thank you? How about being grateful to God and grateful for our fellow believers? How about showing and demonstrating the positive responses of gratitude, thanksgiving, praise? Parents, we are very quick, huh? Wrong, wrong, do this better, no good, no good. Ah. And our kids grow up thinking everything no good, eh? <laughs> everything always no good. Eh? <laughs> well, how about the appreciation that comes from the overflow of gospel blessings in our life? Things are never going to be perfect on this side of heaven, brothers and sisters. You will meet evil people because of sin. There are consequences of sin. But there is a lot to be thankful for in the blessings of the gospel. How about we resonate the positivity of mutual appreciation? Where we can appreciate each other for journeying together you know, it doesn't matter if it's not the best in the world, right? I I've used this illustration before. I don't grade my wife's cooking on 0 to 100, or today 80%. Yeah? Yesterday 75, tomorrow I hope you did 90%. What kind of relationship is that? Our relationships are not based on performance. They're based on love that God has shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit because God sent His Son. This is love. God demonstrated His love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is Christ who deserves that glory of our love. He was the one that told us to love one another. A new commandment I give to you. You love one another as I have loved you. By this will all men know you are my disciples. Glorify Christ. He deserves to be glorified. Obey Him in our love. Build relationships that are personal and warm and inclusive and appreciative. So much we can learn from one chapter of names and greetings, yeah? But there is more. Let's follow good ministry models. Let's follow good ministry models. I mean, this is quite deliberate, isn't it? This is a letter to the Roman church. He's not there. And I was discussing this with my family because we discuss the New Testament challenge every night. I was discussing, why do you think Paul is writing names to people they know? Well, because when the Roman church picks up their letter and says, yeah, I know this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Well, these are great ministry models. We have great ministry models in our midst, here in our local church. They spend all generations. Yesterday and today, I received messages from a young deacon, young kid, 
so anxious about his care group and, and the arrangements for his care group and the people in his care group. I thank the Lord for him. I think about faithful men and women who serve with elderly. We have an elder. He cries. Past three Tuesdays during staff prayer, he cried, and this elder doesn't normally cry. He cried because he says, the people that I serve want to come back to church. Can we make it happen? Oh, we have ministry models in our church that we can look up to who are faithful partners for the gospel. Paul cites several of them, and I want you to see that he puts an emphasis in this passage inclusively on women. And that's surprising in first century Rome. Look at this. He begins by saying, Phoebe, a servant of the church at Cancria, or Chancria, she has been a patron, a benefactor of great help of many and of myself as well. Phoebe, first person that was highlighted, a woman trusted to bring God, trusted to bring Paul's letter. If you wonder how Paul's letter got to Rome, Phoebe was bringing it. She was a trusted sister. That's why she, he told her, do whatever she wants, please receive her and help her because she has been a benefactor of great help of many and of myself as well. Now, there's a question of whether she's a deaconess, because that's a term servant, uh, diakonos. Really, that term is used of many people in the New Testament. But in the context, it seems that she was some kind of official of the church at Tantria, specifically. So we have good people going either way. The important thing is not to focus on whether you must be named deaconess so and so. Lah, huh? That's not the important thing. The important thing is to focus on whether you are playing that capacity, following a good ministry model of a servant. Phoebe was, and she was a lady. She was a great benefactor, a person of great help, too many. The second, Prisca and Aquila. And Prisca and Aquila is actually a married couple. And Aquila is the husband. And Prisca is short for Priscilla. Priscilla and Aquila. And out of the six times they are mentioned in the New Testament, four times the wife is mentioned first. And there are many theories about why the wife is mentioned first, yeah? But the point is, the wife is mentioned first. Could it be that she is more gifted, more known? Could it be that God endowed her with greater gifts of grace? Now, men, I want to ask you, if you're married, what happens if your wife is more gifted than you? What happens? What should you do? Praise the Lord. That's what you should do, okay? Praise the Lord that you have a wife who is gifted. Because this couple was so effective. I mean, Paul describes that they risk their necks for the gospel and for me. And it's not just me who gives thanks, it's all the churches that give thanks for them. Acts 18, which we read this week, tells us Paul first met them at Corinth because they were tent makers. Paul went into business with them. Paul was their fellow tent maker. And then they stuck with him through thick and thin. So much so, they were so helpful that they could be left to supervise Ephesus. And Paul left them there. And at the time where they were there, there was a great preacher named Apollos who came and preached so well because God had endowed him. But he had got certain things wrong because he didn't know about certain things. And it was Priscilla and Aquila that drew him aside, this couple, and clarified certain aspects of theology for him. What great impact that would have made to the kingdom of God. I mean, imagine a gifted man like Apollos. If he's corrected and willing to learn, he says, yeah, that's the right theology. I didn't know about that. 
Praise God for Priscilla and Aquila. Married couples, you can serve together. It doesn't matter if your wife is more gifted than you. You can still together join in the struggle for the gospel. Mary and Persis, two other names, worked hard, worked hard. We see a pattern. We see a pattern of commitment, of loyalty, of hard work for the sake of the gospel. Whether single, like Phoebe, or Mary, or Persis, mentioned alone, whether married, like Prisca and Aquila, whether slave or treasurer of the city, whether Gentile or Jew, there is a desire to be committed to serve together for the gospel. We have really good ministry models in our church, not so much for the result, but for the hard work of the gospel. At the end of the day, brothers and sisters, the results are left to our God. This happens in every arena in life. You take an exam, you work hard, right? Hopefully you work smart, but you work hard. Can you assure yourself that you will get the best result? You can't. That's out of your hands. Results are in the hands of the Lord. Don't kid yourself to judge ministry by results. Faithfulness, commitment, joining together as clear partners for the gospel, going the distance. We've had so many seniors. We conducted several funerals during COVID-19 already. But they have gone the distance. This past week, one of our Chinese congregation members who used to drive the bus for golden blessings and used to come down during foreign friends' ministry to teach the Chinese migrant workers. He was called home. He used to pop by my office, say, Pastor, how are you? I want to ask you something. <laughs> well, we thank God that we have people who last the distance whether young or old, they join together for the gospel. You know, I, I'm glad that God adds to our church. We don't deliberately go our way. We give the gospel, but we don't take from other churches, yeah? God brings them for certain good reasons. We receive them openly if they're willing to commit. But I had this member, and he's not even an old member. He's quite recent, yeah? Within the past five years. Tells me, Pastor, whenever a new member comes uh, and applies for a new member, please tell them, tell me where you're going to serve. <laughs> he's right. Okay, I mean, he's a bit austere, but he's right. His position is that if you come here, please come to serve. La. Don't just come and serve me. La. He's right. I, I do it in a little more gentle way with our new members. I, t I ask them where they're going to get involved. I don't, I don't make them sign a form and commit themselves. But church is not watching a show, right? Church is not, serve me. Church is where we can serve one another for the gospel of Jesus Christ. COVID-19 has thrown up so many wonderful people in our church. I think of the team at the back. I think of our people who are serving our children Sunday mornings. I think of our people who are serving our elderly. I think of our people who are counselling, supporting families during difficult times, job support. I think of our people who have reached out to migrant workers for the gospel. I checked the FFM WhatsApp group, and the number astounds me. So many of our people were willing to join together for the gospel. 
God has given us all life every day on this side of heaven every day is a blessing would we not join together as co-workers finding a role to play as we serve one another and reach out with the gospel of Jesus Christ as an announcement today in our e-bulletin because we look to begin all services from next year Yes, including our Hokkien service, because there's so much want to come back. We'll do it safely, in line with MCCY restrictions. But you can imagine that for the English congregation, we will not be able to meet in a single service. And so, we have designed two services, one on Saturday at 5 p.m., and one on Sunday at 10.30 a.m., which is our regular slot. We will still live stream for those that are unable to come. But Lord willing, we will run our juniors together on Sunday morning. And there's an announcement today for a need for primary, upper primary junior teachers and assistant teachers. We want this to be sustainable for phase three. We don't want people to have the ballot, yeah? Every week must ballot for place. No, we want a, everyone who wants to come back to have a permanent slot, and we have to zone everyone, yeah? Zones of 50. So you, you can't just go, oh, yeah, this week got the ballot again, don't know which zone. No, let's have a permanent slot and a permanent zone. Lord willing, there can be changes, yeah? Uh, subject to capacity, but I've started calling you, haven't I? Some of you know this. Some of the people say, Pastor, you work very hard. Why don't you just put a Google form out and sign up? I say, well, it's my turn to be personal and to be warm and to be inclusive and to be appreciative. After all, how many people do we have? 400 over in the English congregation? I have time. We have six weeks before we begin. My intent is to welcome you back, for those of you who want to come back, to assure you that there's a place for you, that we can come happily, joyfully, together, to resume our worship. Now, some will be asked if you would go to Saturday at 5 p.m., because logically, not everyone can crowd on Sunday. And I've had so many positive encounters already. There's one family I wanted to connect with, especially... The head of family said, Pastor, no need. We understand. 5 p.m. Saturday is where we are coming because we don't need children's ministries. I so much appreciate some of our people in our church. Automatic. They are thinking for other people. Now, I'm not fussing if you're coming on Sunday. Please come. Okay? Some of you work on Saturdays. I understand. Some of you come to be with your children and grandchildren. Some of you come to serve. Whatever configuration fits you. Lord willing, we will find a way. We'll find a way to come back happily, joyfully, where everyone feels that they are welcome as we join together to worship Jesus. I've received many appreciating, many texts and emails of appreciation during COVID-19. I thank you for that. It makes my day whenever I get some appreciation. And I'm sure it makes everyone's day. I'll end with just this observation because my time is up. I'm wearing some ethnic thing today. Largely because this weekend I connected with Bangladeshi brothers, Indian brothers, Filipino brothers, Indonesian brothers. Just to tell them I'm praying for you too. Because all the churches of Christ greet you. And Paul wasn't even there, was he, when he told the church at Rome, 
greet one another with a holy kiss. I greet you. My team greets you. And for every single person that I connected with, the response has been fantastic. Because mutual blessings flow between believers of the gospel who join together for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mutual blessings flow in relational measure out of the one who first loved us and gave himself for us. It's difficult to put on the overflow of joy and peace. It's difficult to fake the warmth of genuine relationships. Praise God, we can join in the struggle together for the gospel. Some questions now for our care groups and small groups we've requested for these questions. Do I build relationships for gospel living and sharing? Do I commit to an accountability partner? Do I commit to a small group or ministry? Am I growing to be more personal, warm, inclusive, and appreciative? Am I a selfish solo, BPCC serve me, or a team player? How can I serve together? Do I learn from committed ministry models who are gospel partners? Searching questions, questions for all of us. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the loving relationship we have with you in Jesus Christ. We know from your word, the gospel and the living out of the gospel is not a solo sport. Father, would you give us the joy of being part of this local church where others are following Jesus, where we can follow him together to live out the gospel and make Jesus known. Oh, Father, this message is not for everyone around us. We know this is what you want me to do. And our oh, Father, you know our situation in Singapore. We are busy. We value privacy. You know our differences, our different backgrounds, our different temperaments. We ask for your spirit to convict us that we would take your word seriously. That the people we call Pastor Panjan Christ Church would love and greet and care in personal, warm, and inclusive appreciation. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for the times we are selfish and we all lapse into that at times. Forgive us for thinking that PPCC is here for me. Help us to remember the biblical reality that we are to live together for the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.